Hello and welcome to CQ, the AWS Certification Quiz Show, brought to you live at Sydney Summit 2019. We're down here on the ex exhibition floor, so please do come see us. We've got a number of shows going on today, um, tomorrow and on Thursday. So today, we are going to be looking at the Solutions Architect Associate Level Exam. And today, I've got with me one of our ANZ trainers, Alex. Alex, tell us a bit more about what you do here at AWS. Ah, thanks, MJ. So I'm a technical trainer for AWS, meaning I get to travel around all of Australia, meeting all of our awesome clients, and running them through either one or three day technical courses. Nice, yeah. wonderful to have you here today. Thanks for so having me. So just for everyone's reference, we are using the Wiley book for um, our exam questions today, which is available at wiley.com, also available at amazon.com. So Alex, are you ready to jump into some questions with me today? Absolutely. Awesome. First question, up today, bit of loose coupling. When designing a loosely coupled system, which AWS service provides an intermediate durable storage layer between components? And we're looking for two answers on this question, Alex. Oh, that's a great question. So it's important to remember when we're taking a look at certification questions, you always want to look for the key components of every single question. Now, reading through this question here, okay. I think the key takeaway points that we're looking for is a durable storage layer, because that's really going to rule out some of the answers that we're about to go through. Didn't roll off the tongue that easily either, so. <laughs> no, not exactly. <laughs> so option A, Amazon CloudFront. Now, CloudFront is our content distribution network. So it's really great at taking that content and getting out closer to the customers. However, it's really not going to get us any place to store our resources, right? There's no data that is being held onto by CloudFront there. So, so what do we think about B then? B, Kinesis. Kinesis is our data streaming service, allowing us to stream data in real time. Now, we can absolutely store content inside of Kinesis, meaning that this looks like a pretty solid answer. OK. So we're looking for another one. We have to continue on, though, just to see what the other ones hold. So Route 53. Uh, Route 53 is our managed DNS service. It's not going to allow us to hold content in there. It's great for our DNS entries, and really, that's what its expertise lies in. So that's okay. not going to be working for our decoupling. Fair enough. Uh, CloudFormation. CloudFormation is great for building out our architecture, for building out that decoupled system. Yep. Uh, but it's not going to store the data itself. So we can strike that one off as well. Leaving us with our last answer, E, SQS, our distributed messaging system. This allows us to store our content between our different tiers and pass data from okay. one level of the application into the other level. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. Leaning towards B and E then, right? Yeah, that does give us B and E. So this brings me to all of you wanting to follow along with us. Please, please, you know, join in on the online chat. Uh, at the minute, we have... A and D going on, Alex. So they're not agreeing with you at all, the online audience today. A and D. Oh, B and E is also coming up. B and E is now coming <laughs> up. <laughs> Let's well, check out the answer, that. shall we? All right. B and E it is. Well done, That's expert. That's good to see. <laughs> <laughs> all right, moving on. Route 53. So which type of DNS record should you use to resolve a domain name to another domain name? And this one just requires one answer, Alex. Gotcha. So when we're looking at our DNS entries, you really have to know some basics around DNS when you're sitting for this exam. So okay. this one is kind of flat. Do you know it? Do you not know it? Based off of your familiarity with DNS. Sure. So let's go through the answers. So option A, uh, an A record. Now an A record, we're not really looking to point to an IP address here, right? An A record is giving us a .com address to an IP address. When we're looking to point a website to another website, uh, that's not really going to give us the answer. Sure. So Option B, a C name. Now, the C name is what allows us to essentially create that shortcut. This is what our online viewers are favoring at the minute, Alex. Exactly, and I think this is going to be what we want to go with. But it's still important when you're going through these questions to look at every single option, just in case you see something better. Bit of an exam tip there, is it? Exactly, yes. Good. Three. So, three, uh, <laughs> a D record. Now, this isn't a thing, right? This isn't a type of DNS entry. So here's where you have to have that familiarity because you're going to see distractors where we just flat make up terms or make up tech <laughs> things that don't exist. Straight from the horse's mouth, yeah. we make <laughs> up terms. <laughs> we do. Nice. Uh, last one, a pointer record. Now, a pointer record allows us to do that reverse DNS lookup. That's not going to answer the question here. Leaving us solidly with option uh, B, a C name. Should we check it out? The poll at the minute, John, what are we looking, looking like at? Number two is the popular answer. Awesome. Two is correct. I'm glad Copy, we could get that one. As you said. 
All right, question three. You ready for another one, Alex? Yeah. Moving on to SQS. Your application polls an Amazon SQS queue frequently and returns immediately, often with empty responses. What is the one thing that can be done to reduce Amazon SQS costs? Sure. So looking at this one. One answer. That is always good to know how many we're looking for. Yeah. So looking at this answer, we want to focus on those couple bullet or those couple points that you mentioned. One, empty responses. Right, this leads me to believe that we're polling the queue too frequently and I'm not coming back with anything. And two, cost. We have to understand basics around how cost works for our AWS services. So lots of clues in the question, Al. Yeah, those are the two that we're, po we're pulling from. Okay. So our first option. Uh, pricing on SQS does not include cost for service requests, therefore this isn't a concern. That one raises some red flags for me. I'd say so. Yeah, we're not, uh, when you're interacting with the service, there is going to be a charge based off of those API calls that you're making. So because of that, we can safely strike off the first one. Getting rid of number one. What about number two, Al? Two, uh, increase the timeout value for short polling uh, to wait for messages longer before returning a response. Now, this sounds like it's going to be a good idea, right? We want to reduce the amount of times that we're pulling the queue. However, if we're increasing that value for short polling, it's no longer short polling. That's going to be called <laughs> something else. We'll talk about here in a second. OK. So that one sounds great, but we got to move on. Three, change the message visibility value to a higher number. Now, this is dealing with how long messages are invisible in the queue once they've been pulled down, sure. how long my resources take to process the content. That's not going to be related to frequently polling. So it's most likely going to be the last one. Let's take a look. Use long polling by supplying a value for wait time seconds. This is what we're looking for. By enabling long polling, we're connecting to the queue less frequently. We're waiting for those messages to come in. So I'm not making those frequent connects and disconnects. So I'm going to go with four as the right answer. So on the poll, they will favor number three. Number three. All right. You want to see how Ready? we did? John, any questions coming through? Uh, no, but I'll, I'll do a shout out here. We have Corey Quinn from last week in AWS, a famous person watching other famous people. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Hi, Corey. And the answer is number four. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. That's why you're the expert. <laughs> Ready for question four? Let's do it. Databases. Cool. Which AWS database service is best suited for traditional online transaction, transactional processing? Gotcha. So this one, we really just need to be familiar with the kind of databases that AWS offers. Yeah. Now, this is an ever-expanding suite of services, so you've got to know generally what they're being used for here. So let's take cool. a look at each one of them. Option A, Redshift. Now, Redshift is our managed BI data warehouse. Because this question isn't really dealing with no. our BI team, right? I, I don't think Bit this is going to work for us. Bit of a curveball in there, right? Yeah. So option two. Um, RDS, Thanks, our relational database service. RDS is going to be, well, most likely what we want to utilize here, right? When we're doing those transactions, sure. we need to store our content. That relational database gives us, well, the best place to put it. Still, we need to view the rest of the answers. Three, ElastiCache. Now, ElastiCache is our managed caching solution. It's a managed version of either Memcache or Redis. Um, it's a really useful service inside of our application, but it's not going to be where we want to hold on to those transactions. So because it's going to be more temporary, we can safely strike that one off. Go on. Last one, Neptune. Neptune. Yeah, now while Neptune <laughs> has one of my favorite names that we've recently announced, uh, it's a managed graph database, okay. which isn't going to be related Not to what really the question. Not really what we're looking for, right? Not at all. So my final answer is going to be option two, uh, the relational database service, or RDS. 100% online <laughs> agreeing with you, Al. Let's awesome. reveal the answer. Two it is. Great. I'm glad the folks RDS at home agree. All, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Last question from us today, guys. Uh, monitoring. Ready? Absolutely. Is the basic monitoring package for Amazon EC2 in what Amazon CloudWatch metrics are available? Gotcha. Now, this is one that you're going to have to be familiar with before okay. sitting for the exam. Um, you're going to have to have that deep understanding of CloudWatch. So what we're looking for here is, what do we get out of the box? What are the basics sure. checks that we need to be aware of? So let's go through this. Yes, please. One, web server visible metrics, so it's just number of failed transaction requests. Now, that sounds like something important that we should be monitoring. 
right? I want to know if something's not working inside of my application. I'd say that would be a pretty good thing, <laughs> Absolutely. <huh? laughs> but this isn't one where we're going to get this out of the box because okay. the question didn't specify that we've gone through and installed that custom metric. We have to safely assume that the agent hasn't been installed. That's not going to be natively there. Okay. So we can skip over that one. Two. Are operating system visible metrics, such as memory utilization? Now, I don't know about you, but I've been in that situation where the memory fills up on my host and everything goes awry. Yeah, that's a problem. Haven't we all? Yeah. <laughs> but now that's not something that we're going to get out of the box. Because AWS doesn't have insight through that hypervisor level, we can't track that memory or that disk usage out of the box. Yep. So we can safely skip that one. Go on. What about number three? What are you thinking? Three, are database visible metrics, yep. such as the number of connections. Now, this would be something that we might get, say, out of the box with RDS, but we don't with EC2. Because once again, that's at the application level metric. We'd have to install the custom agent and gotten that extra check. We can't safely assume that that's been done already. OK, fair enough. So four, oh, uh, the last one, that hypervisor level metric, such as CPU, CPU. utilization. That's another really important one. And while that kind of goes hand in hand with what we want to monitor at, with our memory, the CPU is something that we get out of the box. Because okay. AWS can track how used is that CPU. Yep. What is it exactly sure. up to? So I'm going to go with four as my final answer. John, how are we looking online? Everybody is agreeing with you. Agreeing awesome. with you, Al. I'm glad Let's for that. Let's reveal this final answer. Thank you so much for of being course. my special guest for Thank the you. architecting exam today. It's been fun, MJ. It's always fun out. So please join us again later today. We've got two more shows, another Architecting and another ML this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us.